So in the interest of starting on time, I uh, apologize for cutting off the coffee break and the interesting discussions going on. I also apologize for my voice. I have laryngitis. So I will uh, spare you by uh, doing the dutiful moderator bit and being as quiet as possible. So what you have uh, before you are two uh, prominent experts on uh, a variety of issues, but obviously this panel uh, is about East Asia and approach to international dispute settlement. And I stress international dispute settlement because as many of you are aware, and if you certainly weren't aware, uh, the Philippines dispute before it lost uh, and China's reaction to it certainly brought that back uh, to bear, at least in many parts of Asia, perhaps East Asia, but other parts of Asia as well. There is a sense by some people that we have to distinguish international dispute settlement, which is the feeling that all countries have and all the duties all countries owe under the UN <laughs> Charter to settle their disputes without resorting to war. Uh, everybody agrees that much, but they distinguish, at least some folks, between settling disputes peacefully and doing so through formal uh, international courts where judges are charged with settling the dispute under international law and doing so where the judges are not all chosen by the parties. That is, there is a difference between international courts and international dispute settlement. One of the debates here is whether there is Asian values with respect to international dispute settlement. And for some people, it goes along with debates that uh, have been uh, joined by people like Simon Chesterman writing in Singapore about rule of law notions uh, and the idea that at least among some Asian countries, rule of law is a rather minimalist notion that should not be confused with, for example, broad notions of human rights or adjudicating disputes through formal courts charged with binding authority, at least outside of the national courts. And so one question that emerges, and I think it's a natural follow-up to the wonderful discussion we had, is whether uh, Asian values here translate to Chinese values and how does that relate to, for example, the actions of other countries on the planet, including the United States. To simplify, perhaps some people think that for a long time, at least in recent history, the United States approach to international courts was not too different from Chinese approach to international courts. Neither country participated in the ICJ, at least not through compulsory jurisdiction, and not uh, through anything other than somebody else forcing them there. Uh, and certainly that is true of the US, even though it was a frequent uh, a participant in ICJ courts, it was purely at its own volition or uh, through unfortunate circumstances, unfortunate in quotes, where the US had made the mistake of signing onto a treaty that provided for ICJ jurisdiction. It doesn't do that uh, anymore. Uh, the United States, obviously, like China, doesn't much care for, or at least does not participate in the International Criminal Court, and it is not a party to any binding regional human rights court. And like the United States, uh, China also participated, made two exceptions, trade and investment disputes. It learned over time to participate in the WTO, and it learned over time to participate in investment arbitration tribunals pursuant to some uh, bilateral investment treaties and free trade agreements in which it would agree to arbitration for those investment disputes. Today, there is some possibility of change with respect to the US approach to the WTO and with respect to investor state dispute settlement. It is no secret that the Trump administration has resisted uh, appointing an appellate judge in the WTO, and that whole system is one judge away from collapsing. Uh, and it is no secret that the new NAFTA 2.0 uh, does not have investor state dispute settlement for future disputes between the United States and Canada. And if that's a sign of things to come, 
perhaps the United States will walk away from investor state dispute settlement. So far, there is no clear indication that China will do the same. In fact, in the Silk Road Initiative, there is at least the rhetorical position that China will continue to pursue investor state dispute settlement. And there is still, apparently, the rhetorical position that, the, uh, that China will not walk away from the WTO. But one question I would have for this audience and perhaps for our, our, our two speakers is whether that's likely to change. That is, will China now have uh, a similar approach to trade and investment disputes, uh, where at least in those two areas, it has accepted supranational scrutiny of what it does uh, domestically on those two issues. Well, we have two perfect uh, individuals to discuss this. You have in your program bios of both of them. I'll just say a few words uh, uh, about Judge Awada, who will be addressing you uh, in his major address, and then Benedict Kingsbury, my colleague here, will comment. So Judge Awada gained degrees at the University of Tokyo in Cambridge. He worked in the Japanese Foreign Service as ambassador, permanent representative of Japan at the OECD. In Paris, deputy minister of foreign affairs, uh, extensive experience as ambassador, permanent representative of Japan at the UN, and therefore contributed uh, significantly to the greatest hits of international law, the Declaration of Friendly Relations, the Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, the Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties, uh, of course, he joined the International Court of Justice in 2003, was appointed president in 2009, and I suspect that perhaps a great deal of his remarks will deal with the ICJ. Uh, with respect to Benedict Kingsbury, what can I say? He's the idea person here. Uh, the rest of us just passively follow his guidance, uh, whether it's global administrative law, global tech law. Uh, most of us didn't know an algorithm until he told us how to spell it. Uh, <laughs> And he is, of course, the director of the Guarini Institute now uh, and is a blazing force uh, for unity among our rather, um, let's just say, ego-filled international law faculty. So with that, I'll turn it to Judge Awada for his remarks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yes. Um, after such an elaborate introduction by Professor Jose Alvarez, Perhaps I don't have to speak. He has, he has covered all the grounds that I would have liked to cover. Uh, before I get into um, my presentation, I just want to give you a warning that compared with the, the earlier session, which was much more lively and focused on the concrete issue which excites you, I'm not going to talk about any concrete issues. Now, this, I'm sure this is a disappointment to you. Many people, friends of mine who are here, came to me before this session, uh, and they, they all said uh, that they are looking forward to, uh, to my presentation. I know that that's a, that's a lip service, but nevertheless, I just, I just do not want to disappoint you after my presentation. Rather than doing that, I would like to disappoint you before my presentation <laughs> by, by telling you that what I'm going to say is banal and not, not so in uh, 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 exciting as, as you have heard in the first session. Now, as Jose has introduced to you, I'm going to talk about the issue of um, international dispute settlement in East Asia, and particularly focusing on the question that, that Jose has, has touched upon, namely the, the so-called prevailing or pervading perception that Asia is averse to, or at least reluctant to um, uh, go to um, uh, third party settlement with binding force. Now, I said that this is, a, this is a pervading, but also a prevailing perception. At least that used to be the case for, 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 for some years. I have some evidence here, if, if you're interested in, in my quotation, but I'm not going to talk about it in order to save time, because I think it's more interesting to have discussion. But at least um, some eminent scholars like um, uh, Professor Kala, uh, 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 um, uh, Professor Ma uh, Green, uh, have written articles saying that um, 
Asia has a traditional Confucian culture. East Asia has a con traditional Confucian culture which tries to settle uh, uh, dispute not through conflict of interest but through informal ways. Uh, this, this is not, not an exact accurate uh, uh, quotation from, from the articles, but if you are interested, you can, you can certainly uh, uh, look, look at them in, 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 in their writings. I, I have the quotation here, but I'm not going to quote you in order to save time. Now, what I'm, the first point I would like to make is that this is a myth which you should not really believe in. And I, 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 I want to talk about it from two different aspects. One is a question of the empirical data. If you look at the concrete performance of the countries in East Asia, with certain exceptions, with certain exceptions of the countries and with certain exceptions in the areas, generally the, the opposite has been the true in recent, in, in recent years. The second point is that if you analyze the factors which have been affecting their behavior, you will find that there are specific reasons for uh, creating an, an impression that certain countries or, or East Asian countries in general seem to be somewhat reluctant in going to arbitration or judicial settlement. For I wouldn't say for good reasons, but for understandable reasons. The reasons may, may not be good. You, you may deplore that, but nevertheless, there are reasons, specific reasons, that can explain why they have been taking that position. And this is no different from the attitude of other countries in other regions of the world, Latin America, Africa, or even Europe. And also, that, has, that problem has to be looked at in the, in, in, in the, in the context of the, of the time frame. Namely, when you talk about the attitude of European countries, you have to think about the attitude of the European countries in the 19th century, in the second half of the 19th century, or the beginning of the 20th century, when this pro problem, question of um, international arbitration and eventually the creation of permanent international court of justice uh, have, uh, did, did come about. Uh, and and there, are, there are certain lessons to be learned from that experience. So that is the background against which I would like to, um, to, 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 uh, to talk about this problem. Now, to giving the, the uh, first take up, taking up the, the evidential, uh, uh, ex uh, excuse me, the, the empirical evidence that, um, that, that I can quote is that, uh, for example, um, there are three specific characteristics affecting the, the attitude of the, of, the, of the Asian states in relation with international adjudication. First is the geographic and, and topical uh, diversity in the, in, in, in the, um, among the states in, in, in the countries. And um, the, the topical diversity meaning that there are certain areas where countries are much more prone to come to <coughs> accept the uh, Judici adjudication process <coughs> rather than others. So to generalize, to, to, to make an over, uh, oversimplified statement that Asians by, by their traditional cultural background, deriving sometimes, as, as alleged sometimes, deriving from the Confucian philosophy of making uh, not to not to make conflicts with with your neighbors is 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 um, is, is just a, just a, just a, just a, a, a guesswork or speculation on the part of the people who thought that that might be the case, but there are, there are no evidence to establish that 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 is the case. And in fact, the empirical uh, examination of the, the the data. I'm not going to get into all the data which I have. If you're interested, I think that data is going to be published in the in the forthcoming book 
of which I'm one of the editors, and I, I wrote that particular uh, piece on the international dispute settlement in Asia, where um, this is a this is a hand, Oxford handbook of international law in Asia, which is going to be published hopefully next year. And um, in that in that uh, piece, I try to analyze on an empirical basis how much. Uh, of, of Asian countries have been participating in different uh, uh, adjudication process like the International Court of Justice, advisory opinions with the International Court of Justice, contentious cases uh, advisor, uh, the International Court of Justice, WTO, investment disputes, uh, ITROS, law of the sea issues, uh, human rights issues, and so on and so forth. And you, have, you cannot really generalize the whole situation. You have to get into, more in, 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 into greater detail in the, in the same specific diversity that, that exists in, 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 the, in the behavior of the countries involved. That is, a, that is the first point I wish to make. The second point I wish to make is that, um, generally speaking, there is a facility or psychological facility with which states in Asia are prepared to approach international dis uh, dispute settlement, settlement process. In other words, if you take the, the, the past examples, you will find that um, there are, I, I, I can give you in, in general terms, uh, without getting into the specific statistics, you can, you can, I, I can tell you that a greater cases, a greater number of countries in East Asia have been offering the written, com, written, com, written uh, responses, written uh, comments to the advisory proceedings before the International Court of Justice than any other regions of the world. From, uh, not, I'm, I'm talking about the non-Western uh, countries of the world, Africa, Latin America, uh, uh, and Central uh, Asia and so forth. Uh, East Asia has been comparatively, if you talk about the, the written um, observations to be offered to the International Court of Justice, East Asian countries are greater than, than, other, than, than, than the number of countries from, from different regions of the world. When it comes to the contentious cases, in recent years at least, there are many more countries from East Asia which are equal in number to the cases brought by African states and Latin American states. Although African states and, and, and Latin American countries have been, uh, had been more frequently uh, coming to, to the International Court of Justice than they used to. And by comparison, the Western European countries are less often coming to the International Court of Justice for good reason, because they have created the European Union and the dispute between states, uh, many of the disputes between states would come, go to uh, the, um, the, their own European Court of Justice. But there are exceptions, like the case which came before the International Court of Justice in recent years between Italy and Germany, which interestingly, came to the International Court of Justice as an issue relating to the sovereign immunity issue, although the substance of the matter is a question of the, um, of the treatment of nationals, Italian nationals uh, in, uh, in, in Germany during the Second World War. Um, but with that exception, if you compare the performance of the International Court of Justice in that respect with the performance of the Permanent Court of International Justice, there is a clear difference. At the time of the PCIJ, many of the cases in, in contentious areas were brought by European countries, mainly because of the dispute which arose as a result of the, of the, the implementation of the Versailles Treaty and, and the, the aftermath of it. Whereas now, European countries, Western European countries, very rarely come to the International Court of Justice. And uh, that applies also to Eastern European countries, although there are cases like um, uh, Czechoslovakia versus Hungary, which is now uh, become a case between Slo Slovakia versus, um, versus, uh, versus Hungary. But 
These are rather, rather small number of cases, and compared with that, there are many more con uh, countries coming from, from Africa coming to the International Court of Justice. And may, in terms of the numbers, there are a number of countries coming from Latin America before the International Court of Justice. But there are good reasons for that. One is that um, <clears throat> in the case of Latin American countries, but including the Caribbean countries, Caribbean countries, the, the issue of maritime delimitation became a big issue. And, and most of the case, not all, but many of the cases which come before the International Court of Justice in recent years have, uh, that have come from Latin American countries are related to this question of the maritime delimitation. Uh, Africa, again, as a result of the, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the end of the colonialism in Africa, there are cases where the uh, maritime delimitation and even land uh, boundary disputes came before the International Court of Justice. And uh, it's remarkable that African countries have decided to, to make use of the, uh, the International Court of Justice as a final arbiter for settling the international disputes. Compared with that, Asian countries have be, had been lagging behind, but in recent years they have come up with, a, um, with um, not exactly an equal number, but increasingly large number, which would be comparable to the cases which have been brought by Latin American countries and, um, and African countries. If you take the East Asian countries in recent years, there has been a, 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 a dispute relating to the, to, the, to, the, to the islands between Malaysia and in, Indonesia, uh, and, and also a case between um, uh, Singapore and, uh, and Malaysia uh, concerning the, the, the uninhabited islands in the, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the Strait of Singapore. Also, there has been a, a case between Cambodia and, uh, and Thailand uh, involving the, the, uh, the, the, the land territory where the, the, the famous uh, prayer Bihar temple uh, uh, was situated. Now, all these are examples where Asian countries, in spite of the reputation or in spite of the prevailing perception that I talked about, have decided to come to the court on the basis of special agreements in many cases, but sometimes on the basis of, um, of, of some of the uh, 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 compromissory clauses in the treaty or uh, by the unilateral declaration <coughs> under Article 36 of the Statute of the Court. So again, empirically, if you take the, even the, uh, the cases of even the International Court of Justice, the, 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 the so-called myth is, 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 it has not been established as reality. But if you go to some other areas, like the economic disputes between states, going to the WTO for um, a high-level dispute panel, I think Asia is perhaps the, the largest in number among the non-Western countries to go to, to initiate the proceedings before the WTO. Um, uh, uh, when you talk about the investment disputes, again, the number of investment disputes ref which has been referred to international arbitration or ICSID under the World Bank uh, have, been, um, have been quite, quite, quite large in number. Um, when it comes to the human rights, the, 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 the lack of appropriate courts in the, in the region is, is, uh, it creates a situation where these cases are not really uh, brought to uh, the international adjudication among, by, between the Asian states. But and the important point, which I'm going to touch upon later, is, is, is the, the, the fact of the absence of regional courts on human rights in Asia, which is the only region in the world where there is no such human rights uh, court. Africa has one, Europe naturally has one, Latin America has one, and Asia is the only area where, only region of the world where there are no, um, uh, no such um, uh, uh, human rights court. And this in itself is a, 
is a, is a major problem. Apart from the issues that we discussed in an earlier session, uh, namely the, the question of the attitude of China, because China, China's uh, non-participation is not the basic reason why regional calls on, on human rights have not emerged in, in East Asia. I'm going to touch upon that later in, 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 in terms of my conclusion, but, but the, the, the point I wish to make here as, 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 a, as a whole is that the empirical data, if you examine all these cases, uh, belies the the, 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 the prevailing perception that East Asian countries are much more reluctant and, um, and have, ha, ha, have an, an aversion to the, uh, the international litigation process. The, the third factor that affects the, the scene is the The, 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 the point that the diversity in terms of the geo, ge, geological diversity, uh, I'm sorry, the difference rather, not diversity, the difference in terms of the size of the land, the size of the country, and the size of power, and the size of population, all these are reflected in terms of the, uh, the, the the function of power of the states in international relations is a factor which have prevented countries to, to go into um, uh, the, the, the direction of accepting um, um, the international uh, litigation as a process for settling disputes. And here, what is interesting is that in spite of what I have said, positively in terms of the greater degree of readiness on the part of East Asian countries to go to international litigation, there's one common element which is that there is a marked reluctance on the part of East Asians to accept the institutional um, framework of accepting the compulsory uh, jurisdiction in advance of the actual dispute which has arisen. I gave three examples in Asia, previous uh, case, uh, 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 Supadan and Litigan case, and, um, and, um, and uh, Pedro Branca case. Now all these are cases which have brought, been brought before the court after the dispute has arisen between the parties. And compared with that, the Asians have been much more reluctant East Asians have been much more reluctant in accepting uh, in advance the institutional commitment to uh, a mechanism of international dispute settlement uh, in the form of, there are various forms like the acceptance of the optional clause of, um, of the uh, International Court of Justice, uh, the Statute of the International Court of Justice under Article 36 of the Statute, or in terms of the acceptance of the compromissory clause built into um, multilateral and bilateral treaties whereby the, uh, the parties have accepted the, the dispute um, uh, relating to interpretation and application of, of, of disputes in, in, in relation with the interpretation and application of the provisions of the treaty, or the optional protocol uh, of the same kind attached to multilateral conventions. In all these things, Asian countries, if at all possible, to try to, not to try to subscribe to these uh, as compared with other regions of the world. Uh, so with that, with that, uh, uh, conspicuous exception, I think the, the myth has to be destroyed that um, um, that has, has been uh, uh, pervading a notion of the, uh, of the cultural difference of, of Asian country, East Asian countries, leading to this, again, uh, uh, erroneous notion that this is based on the Asian values which are distinct from the Western values. Um, 
Now, I, I come to uh, the conclusion because I shouldn't really, I, I don't want to speak too long because I think it's more interesting to, uh, to, to have the discussion, but to, to, to put it by way of a conclusion, what I want to say is that um, there is a general uh, tendency to, to or willingness uh, or, or proactive tendency on the part of East Asian countries to try to settle disputes when the dispute has a reason by re referring the dispute to international third party uh, decisions like international arbitration, uh, international court of justice, or any other third party uh, arbitration. But the second point is that, as I said, there is a, a much greater degree of resistance or, or reluctance to accept the institutional commitment to a, a prior acceptance of obligations without really knowing exactly what's going to happen. And third point is that um, this generalization on my part has to be a, a little more carefully examined in terms of the kind of issues or issue areas uh, where the, the degree of uh, uh, acceptance or degree of readiness to accept international adjudication uh, varies. And notable example is a, is a human rights issue. Now, I think that here is the area where Asians tend to justify their reluctance by saying that Asian values are different and uh, they are not necessarily the same as the um, as, um, as Western notion of human rights. Now, I personally tend to disagree with that, but I think that, I think that um, as, uh, as Sharon said in, in, in the earlier session, human rights in its basic context, in its essential sense, relates to the question of dignity of individuals as human beings. And if you bring this down to that bottom uh, definition of the, of, the, of the human rights, I think no one would be able to contest that. And even China, which was the subject of discussion in the earlier session, uh, was, uh, was not an exception. They said that they would accept this basic notion of internet, uh, human rights. Uh, I, I think that my own feeling is that uh, there has been some somewhat um, over, uh, over emphasis on, on China's uh, determination to, to, to pursue to create its own world order, uh, including the issue of human rights. I, I, I don't think, I mean, I, I, I don't deny that such, such, a, such an ambition uh, is in the minds of some people, particularly in the context of um, of the, of, the, uh, of the socialist doctrine that China has, has not given up in, 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 in the political context. Although I'm, I'm sure it has uh, virtually uh, uh, destroyed that, 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 that conviction in the economic and trade areas because of the, the practical interest involved. And thirdly, I think um, the, 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 the reality of globalization, as is evidenced in the, in the climate change issues, I think the, the self-interest of China itself forces China to accept certain things uh, in, in, in terms of um, uh, applying uh, universal norms uh, in, in order to settle disputes. So, my own conclusion is that you have to make some distinction about different areas, and, and, and this is, 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 is not so strange if you think about the history of, history of development of international education in the Western context and the European context from the second half of the 19th century. As you recall, in the, in the second half of the 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th century, Western countries, governments, but also international lawyers tend to emphasize the importance of creating an exception in relation with, um, uh, with uh, uh, disputes relating to national honor of the of sovereign states or, or national interests, interest, essential national interests of the states. Now, this has been theoretically 
uh, attacked and, and destroyed by people like uh, uh, so, uh, uh, Hush Rata Pact in his uh, function of law in the international community and so forth. So the Western countries by now have overcome that, that hang up, so to speak, uh, in relation with the, the traditional notion of national honor and vital interest in relation with, uh, with the sovereignty of that state. In, in Asia, as in Latin America and, and in, uh, in Africa, and particularly so in, in, uh, in Asia, this same mi mindset seems to, to prevail uh, uh, the, the reason why that, is, why that is so. I think one factor that we have to take into uh, consideration is that Asia is the only region in the world that we talk about where disparity in the geographic and, uh, and, um, and um, um, uh, uh, size of the population uh, is, is, a, is, is much greater than in, a, in any other uh, regions of the world. And this creates this problem because that tends to prompt states which are in an advantageous position to try to retain their freedom as much as possible in the same mindset as the states which insisted on the issue of national honor and vital interests were trying to, uh, to, to, to safeguard their interest by resorting to, to those notions as intrinsic exception to, um, to, the, um, to, to, to the notion of uh, international adjudication by third parties. Now, to put my conclusion again, to, uh, let me go back to the conclusion. I think the human rights issue does not belong to that category to my mind. I think it, it, in, in a long-term perspective, in a longer-term perspective, if you, boil, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you think about this problem at, at the very basis of what is involved is the question of human dignity of individual human beings. Even a country like China that we talked so much about in, 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 the, in the earlier session cannot deny that, that factor particularly in relation with the progress made, social and economic progress made in China in terms of the welfare of the people would, allow, would, would, would compare the, 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 the government which is in charge of running the state cannot, cannot entirely ignore. Now that it will take time and unless you are convinced which I don't, but unless, which I'm not, unless you are convinced that China is pursuing an ex extremely single-minded goal of creating a new communist world order or new socialist world order uh, in accordance with what they would like to see happen, which I, I'm not uh, in, 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 in a position to, to believe in, but some people might think that that, that is the ultimate goal of the, of the present regime in, in, in China. I think the, the, the social change in the country will affect that situation in relation with human, human rights issues. And therefore, on the human rights issue, in a longer term perspective, I'm more, more optimistic than some of the people who are participating in the discussion in the first session. On the other hand, when it comes to the issues which reflect the, the greatness of, 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 of the state in, in terms of demographic and geographical disparity which exists in countries in the, in the region. This is a much greater, much more difficult issue to, to overcome to my mind. And I think that can be cured only through, through um, understanding of the, of, the, of, the, of the way which the new international order is, is going to work in order to create a better world. And I think this is, this is not an easy task, but nevertheless, I, th I think that one is not to be despaired about such a possibility. And, and therefore, my conclusion is that in general, I'm more optimistic about some of the people who have spoken in an earlier session, including this last question of, um, 
of um, the difficulty which comes from the disparity in, uh, in geographical and demo demographic sense of the word. So I, I had, I'd better stop here and uh, perhaps the rest, there are many more questions which I have left untouched and I'm, I'm sure that will be coming up in our discussion. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure, I think, for the whole law school to be welcoming Judge Iwata back to NYU. And uh, he was one of the foundational figures in the global law faculty when it was created in the second half of the 1990s and uh, uh, got a regular participant there teaching and working with colleagues here and, uh, and also came back from time to time during his tenure in the International Court of Justice. So it's, uh, it's, it's someone we know well who's had a lot of influence, I think, intellectually on some of us here. And it's really kind of you to take the trouble to fly all the way from Japan for this, uh, these, these ventures today and tomorrow. And as uh, some of you will know, uh, uh, Jerry Cohen and Jose Alvarez will be asking some questions to Judge Iwata in a session that we'll have at uh, uh, 6 o'clock tomorrow evening in the faculty library. And, People who want to are welcome to sign up and come along to that uh, for an hour. That'll be it. so. Uh, to, I, I think I'd just like to draw out a few themes, which I think have already been implicit in, in the presentation that Judge Awada gave and, and the introduction that Jose Alvarez made. Uh, and uh, I'm drawing a bit here on my own uh, reading of Judge Awada's works over the years and some previous conversations uh, we, we've had. So. Uh, uh, so I, I, I think he's, he's made the point already, uh, but it, it's, it's just, just to say it directly. So we have, a, when we think of this, our topic here of uh, intergovernmental disputes uh, being settled in some way in, in East Asia, that's the title the jury's given, and jury and I and others to this panel. So, so of course, if, if there's going to be some sort of legal element to this, which is what we're going to talk about, then it, there's got to be some rules of some sort, or principles at least something coming from the law side, let's just call them the rules, and there's got to be some institutions, if it's other than purely bilateral. So we've got rules and institutions, and of course both of those are going to be embedded in some bigger context, which will be uh, partly historical, um, quite dynamic maybe, going forward if things are shifting, uh, and partly also structural, um, as Judge Awada said at the end. Uh, and it, it, I want to come to the rules and institutions in a moment, but just thinking of some of those kind of structural elements um, and within the big context. So he, he made the point that, by and large, very, very big states do, do, uh, do not like to commit themselves in advance to third party binding settlement because they can often do better by settling it by negotiation, pretty clearly. So when one re reviews the uh, acceptances of all kinds of compulsory jurisdictions, um, whether uh, the, the, the ICJ or the regional human rights bodies or quite a few others, by and large, the, the large states of the world are, are, are reluctant there. The, the World Trade Organization is an exception. Or the 10 biggest states of population and economy are all in the WTO and accept that. And uh, the law of the sea, UNCLOS, is an exception too. The US is not in there, of course, but the, the other big states are. But once you get beyond that, you've got a scattering in the accepting the International Court of Justice, compulsory jurisdiction in advance. Japan, of course, does. Pakistan, India, all really though for historic reasons. Um, but the bigger states don't. Um, uh, so and, uh, Russia is by a narrow margin in some of the human rights systems. But you wouldn't bet that they would go there now if they weren't in it already. So, uh, so, so, so we see that as a pattern. And the U.S. exemplifies that, as, as Jose said. So, so it's not surprising then that difference of size will make a difference. Um, and, and conversely, medium states or small states are often in these things, um, and likely to use them, especially I think if they have some sort of British or French heritage and that sort of experience with that kind of legalisation, those ways of organising society and lawyering in the foreign ministry, moving to litigation. Uh, to some extent also the, the Spanish heritage, which we see uh, in, in lots of Latin American countries. So, uh, and it's, but countries coming from outside those, by and large, are going to be more hesitant. And it's not surprising because that structure of binding international adjudication is created but largely by the British and the French, but with the Americans, uh, and not surprisingly, it suits them. And if you look at the 
raft of lawyers who've argued before Judge Iwata and the International Court of Justice over the years, especially in the contentious cases, it's heavily people influenced by British and French uh, uh, traditions um, and the other, other ones. So, uh, so, so, so we shouldn't be surprised that there's unevenness coming from those historic factors as well as from size. Um, and I think if we go a bit further, and if, if we're thinking of the kind of disputes which come in people's mind in East Asia, uh, we have this afternoon a, a panel on uh, Dao Yus and Kaku, uh, the, the, obviously the, the uh, Takishima Tokdo kind of questions, that, 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 that these quite difficult uh, set of issues. Uh, that Jose has mentioned the South China Sea questions already. Uh, things like that, so, so it's it going to involve really high stakes decision making about whether to go into binding settlement. So if, if a state isn't already stuck with this in advance by a prior commandment, but, but by and large, the, the, if we think, why would a state ever go to voluntarily to settle those kind of disputes in, in a third party binding context? Well, the, the, I, I think what, what, one feature is if the, the cost of not settling it is so high that almost any plausible adjudication result is better than having no result. They're better than no settlement. And uh, some people have tried to quantify the, the cost of, of, of leaving unsettled land boundaries. Uh, and the, the slow, less, less crossing of borders, less trade across, increased militarization, sometimes more social violence near land borders. So there's quite a strong argument in a lot of Latin American context that the cost of that year after year after year was one of the reasons when a politician saw the chance that it made sense to settle. And that can be true of maritime disputes also when they get very costly, but, but less because of the economic difference there. Um, so, but but it's, uh, th that's going to limit it to a, a certain set of cases, I think, where, where the cost driver is strong. So, yeah, but, um, I, I, and, but, and I think it's sort of typical further factor has been that if the, the politicians who see that the country will, will benefit from settling a thing, uh, th but they, they can't afford to do it themselves they can't be the person who gave away this or that. So they, they try to shift it to a third party adjudicator and get the public to buy into that by some process. And it could be the Pope or the Tsar of Russia or whoever, but uh, the, these days more often a court. But, uh, but th it's, it's a transfer of responsibility and it's usually because the audience costs for the leader are too high uh, to, to bear it by directly negotiating and saying, I've agreed it, this is it. Uh, they're too vulnerable to the opposition. Now, so, so it, 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 again, some kind of uh, democratic uh, party swapping uh, political structures that, that is more likely to be present. Um, a a, a long-term authoritarian system is, is may, may have, it depends on the issue, may have less of those kind of audience costs leading them to go to, to a third party. So, so it, uh, that, that's just some things to think of there. Why we, we would expect only a very small subset of these serious disputes will, will get near this kind of adjudication voluntarily. Now, why do any of these states commit in advance to, to other people being able to bring them to these tribunals? That's really a mystery if you have a sovereigntist kind of view or will power group, because you're not usually forced to this advance commitment. Uh, it's, a, it's a choice. Maybe, maybe sometimes you make it unwisely or by mistake, and, and one might wonder with some of the countries who entered UNCLOS if they quite fully thought out what might happen, and we've seen the same thing with bilateral investment treaties. Um, so that the early adopters sometimes didn't really know what was going to be. So there could be mistakes, but if it's not a mistake, uh, uh, ordinarily then, if we think why it would be, well, it could be to show some sort of commitment to the whole legal order that the thing's premised on. It could be because the expectation is the disputes won't be so serious. The cost of losing or having to litigate won't be so grave. Or it could be because you have a confidence that you're going to be able to control the tribunal, or at least influence it enough that it, 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 it's a kind of realistic shot at it. So you can imagine those situations. But I think I want to mention one further thing, because I think this hasn't been said in relation to China, but it's, it, it's I think in the future, not yet, not remotely yet, but in the future it's going to be an issue for China as well. Which is, if you're very, very powerful and you want to make a, 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 a treaty or something with, with somebody, uh, or perhaps a multilateral treaty even, well, if you're so powerful uh, that the other people are never going to be able to force you to honour the treaty, they've just got to rely on trusting you, well, th they might not trust you very much. And th that creates what the, the paradox of the credible commitments problem. The credible commitments problem. So a very powerful state has difficulty making treaties with weaker states because they, they can't trust it to do what it said. And so it's setting up a binding court system is one of the efforts to solve the credible commitments problem. 
Um, it's, that is to, to, to make your own commitment trustworthy because you're going to be locked into a settlement, even though at that moment you don't want to do it. So, so that, that's historically been the case. China hasn't used that, but in the future it's in question. And I think uh, all the more so, the US it does less of that because there's still, a, not so much for foreign countries, but for foreign interests, there's quite a lot of chance to sue in US courts. That is, the US legal system is so fierce in relation to the government. One judge can stop a whole presidential policy, uh, maybe not for long, but they, 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 they can do things. So, so the US system is so organized for litigation against the government and to control the government, and, if, and, and foreign interests at least often have some sort of access to that, that US political commitments by the government can be made credible by domestic law and, and suits. Realistically, in China, it's going to be a long time till that gets to be the case. Uh, and uh, uh, Japan, interestingly, of course, does have uh, the, the idea of treaties and customary international law being part of Japanese law, although the amount of litigation directly kind of trying to enforce rights that way is probably quite slender. So I just mentioned that because we can think forward and imagine that China might get more interested in some of these things. Um, of course, China is just beginning to put a little toe towards some of this with the new International Commercial Court. Um, so uh, I, I think there's a kind of two, two other sort of reasons for going to adjudication. Um, which, so, so one is it's sometimes it's very, it's, it's, it's the routine method of governance on a particular issue. And that's almost what we see or saw in the WTO. That it's not so, it's not embarrassing, it's not a huge loss of face to be in litigation there. You can be defending or bring the case or third party intervention. And so uh, it's, just, it's just the way of doing it. It's just the way of doing trade. You've got to have a big rule system like that. You have these political parts and you have a judicial part. So that, that it's, that it's not surprising. We, we don't see anything, any new regimes like that. The big things in the world don't yet have that character. You can imagine Belt and Road could, could be something to think of in the long, long future if it goes that way. But it doesn't look like there's any new ones of those. If anything, it's a matter of propping up the pressures on the ones that exist. Um, and, and I think the sort of fourth reason to, to adjudicate or to go to a third party sometimes is to find facts. So, so if, there's, if the real dispute is what's happened or what's happening, uh, maybe economic empiricism or other things, sometimes having a third party fact finder is quite helpful. Uh, and especially if they can't decide the case, uh, but they can produce a kind of a, a factual knowledge. Uh, the court could, can also produce legal knowledge, but just even the factual knowledge. Uh, and that's a function which so far, I, my impression is in East Asia, uh, there's been some specific examples, commissions of inquiry and so forth, but there hasn't been very much of it. And you can imagine that could be a rather more useful function. Now, of course, uh, to some extent, uh, China and, and Japan and South Korea and uh, others in the region have looked to the United Nations system. I mean, there's still largely a support and confidence in that system, even though it's under pressure. Uh, and when China talks about international order, I think that's what they mean, that kind of universal organizations from that period. So, so those are possibilities. But we can imagine a more third party, semi-adjudicative role there as well. So, so those are just things to think of as, as we think forward about ways that some of these things might, might be pursued and carefully structured. Now, uh, though, coming, if I could, though, for a moment to this question of uh, the, the production of rules and principles for the for law and and the construction of institutions. Uh, so, for, for those who have studied international law, it, it, many books, at least, start with Hugo Grotius, 1625, three volumes, Law of War and Peace. <coughs> it's not exactly that, but that's what it's called. So, What's striking in there is three volumes worth of stuff in 1625. There's nothing about courts. It's a lot of rules, and that coming from natural law and other things. Uh, he only put the courts in, in arbitration, in, in a later edition. So he thought perfectly well you could have law without courts. But in, in the United States thinking, in American thinking, that's come some kind of, it, it, it's a sort of category mistake. If you, if, if you can't get up there with a court or something like it, you haven't really got law, or you, you're, you're pushing uphill, you, 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 you've sort of lost your bearings a bit, or it's an idealistic project. So, but I think it's, sort of, it's still worth keeping in mind that, that the ways in which law is significant without courts. Um, so, uh, and, 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 uh, and Judge Iwata, for years, edited with his predecessor, Judge Oda, the ICJ's predecessor, the, the, the books on Japanese state practice. And they're absolutely full of things from the Japanese diet. 
intense discussions of all kinds of international law questions, and the cabinet secretary or the minister of something is hauled up to answer, what about article something of this treaty, what about the, it's, it's a serious system of legal scrutiny, but without adjudication. And, and I just mentioned that, so there's a lot of that. And, and, but it's different in different places. And, and I think it's not, as, not known so much outside, at least, how much of that goes on in China. Uh, okay, not in the National People's Congress, but are, are there, to what extent is that? And, but we might speculate that in Japan it's quite a lot. You get people like Judge Iwata, who's become Vice Foreign Minister. Uh, you, you get quite significant knowledge of law all the way up and down the Japanese governmental system. Uh, China, the lawyers, apart from the Premier, of course, who's a lawyer, but otherwise the lawyers probably aren't so at the center of the system. Whereas in the US, every second president seems to be a law professor uh, before or after. So, so, so th there's a difference there, uh, I think, in the way in which law is going to be centric to the discussion and the articulation. Um, right. So, okay, so th that's on the one side. Uh, then I think on the institutional side, we would expect that these histories of experience and trust and mistrust will influence the confidence. Uh, Judge Iwata has emphasized the Yokohama house tax case in 1905, Japan losing that, the long hesitation until the Southern Bluefin Tuna case. I think Japan wasn't voluntarily in those kind of cases again. Uh, they weren't very voluntarily in that one. I'm a New Zealander, uh, we brought that case. Quite a convincing case, some of us thought, but uh, didn't win. Uh, and, uh, and the whaling case, uh, I think Japan probably felt they should have won, and Judge Iwata's dissent in that case is quite an interesting document. So, so uh, but, but that history was long. For, for Thailand, the history of the temple case has the same kind of effect. After losing that, we were very skeptical about getting anywhere near these international courts because of a suspicion that someone else is, is, is manipulating it better, uh, that there's something going on there. So, so we've got to keep in mind these specific histories and experience, I, I think, there. And that, that's, I think, the point that Jose and, and Judge White have just both made on the institutions. So, um, but, but, but I think it does sort of remind us that when we think of uh, countries, we don't have to think of that the institutions belonging to their region. Uh, and, but, but there is a challenge if it looks like the institutions belong to somebody else. Uh, and that's the part which has still remained a challenge, I think. And we can imagine there's some amount of remaking of that now. And we see lots of interesting variants which try to escape from that setting, uh, from that image that it's someone else's institution and you can't quite be sure that you're going to be pulling the right strings in there. Uh, okay, so then the, the, the last point I just want to make briefly in in, in relation to context, a uh, bit of a more historical, cultural kind. Uh, and, and, and this, I think, comes to when we think about what law really is here. So I think one of the challenges, we use the term settlement of disputes as if, well, that's the point. And Jose raised that at the start. Uh, but of course, it's not necessarily the only point uh, in something which is legal, has a sort of judicative element. There's more to it than just getting a, a settlement. There's the principal application of law. So. It, 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 there, I, I was very struck reading years ago something that Judge Iwata wrote uh, about uh, Lord Iwakura in 1869. Uh, after the Meiji Restoration in Japan, they were thinking, well, what do we think about these unequal treaties we were forced to sign uh, in the 1850s? What are we going to do about it? Are we going to embrace this law of nations that we're now learning and studying? And, uh, and they, there was a, apparently some sort of connection people felt there with, with some sort of uh, neo-Confucian set of ideas and they thought maybe the one could be morphed into the other somewhat, uh, the kind of public law of nations might be, uh, it, it might be understood that way. Um, so, and, and so he was advocating, yes, let's do it in, in, within Japan. Right? We've got, we could commit ourselves to this, uh, to, to, to this kind of order of reason, justice and faith, you know, the public way of the universe being something like natural law and law of nations. Then he goes off to various European countries to talk to them about renegotiating these unequal treaties. Bismarck tells them, no, it's, uh, it's just all about power. Then it's, it's strong do what they want. Uh, they manipulate the law, and if they, they use it when it suits them and not if it doesn't, he comes back sort of chastened, and it's the story of the, of the disenchanted idealist. I believed in this, now I've come back, I see it's all about power. What are we doing with this thing? So, so uh, on the other hand, generally speaking, the Japanese Meiji government carried on with this legal stuff trying to learn it, study it, get, negotiate treaties, negotiate their way out of the old ones, impose an equal one on Korea, et cetera. Um, so it, they stuck with that. Uh, but I, 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 I'm going through all of that to, but because it's, it, it, it matters there kind of why. What, why are they sticking with it? What, what's understood internally, the, actually how the internal aspect of law here is it, it's not just opportunistic, it's not just calculation. 
but there's also a sort of attitude. Yes, we ought to do this. This is there's something right about this, and it's, it fits our order. It fits our understanding of. And, and if Judge Iwata, if I remember rightly, wrote somewhere or other that one of the reasons that they were keen on international law was that it gave a justification for not going back into isolation. Yes, we can deal with the barbarians, the foreigners, uh, and I think some people in such a mode, one that said, "Whoa, wanted to." Retreat again and say, no, you know, there's a way to deal with them, and it's, it's the same order. The stuff, our order, is their, is their order. We can engage it together. So there are kind of internal drivers also, but a sort of belief there. So, and I think that one of the challenges, and this is where I want to stop, but one of the challenges at the moment in this sort of current tension is, is how much confidence is there that all the different officials amongst the different countries believe the same thing? That is, how much is it just instrumental versus something internalized? And, and there, I think, until that point of real trust is reached, it's unlikely that even the most believing will want to shift into the binding adjudicative mode. Uh, and there's plenty to say about the, the countries and so forth, but I'll stop there so we can talk. So Judge Iwata was provoked enough to uh, do a response. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not provoked. I'm not going to counteract what uh, Professor Kingsley has, has, has said. But I just wanted to make two points in order to endorse the points that he has made. I think he basically has, has made the same points uh, as I try to make uh, in, in, a, in a better language and better illustrations. But there are two things that I wanted to supplement. One is that in talking about the experience of Japan, I think what he has said is, is quite accurate. Japan, at the time of uh, 1868, when Japan opened the country and the Meiji government came about, Japan, after, during the 30 years following that 19, 1868, by the end of the, that century, Japan had seven arbitrations. And three of which I think Japan won, and four was settled by amicable negotiations after initiating the arbitration process, which shows something because that is, that is unusual for a country which just opened the country. I mean, the background is exactly what the Professor Kingsley has just said. But that came to a halt, a major halt, which lasted for 100 years until a few years ago when Japan was reluctant to go to international arbitration, either international, permanent court of international justice or international court of justice, or any other international arbitrations. And that was a shock that the people felt in 1902 at the time of the Yokohama house tax case. Now, this dispute was linked with the division of the unequal treaties that um, uh, Professor Kingsley has referred to. And Japan lost that case. And it was not simply the loss, but the, the case itself, Japan thought that the justice was on their side. And uh, whether they were right or not is, is not the, the issue. The issue is that Japan, the, the whole Japan, including the government, but the people in general, felt that Japan was going to win because the just, justice was on our side. Because Japan was arguing that on the basis of the revision of the unequal treaties, which Japan gained on an equal footing, uh, Japan was, was sure to win, and that they, they lost it in arbitration. And that had a, a shock wave in, in Japan, and Japan decided not to go to arbitration, precisely because this was an intrigue on the part of the Western powers. It's very much the same kind of reaction that you had in many of the East, East Asian countries. Now, this is an interesting lesson in the sense that many Eastern Asian countries had that experience immediately after getting out of the colonial period. But nevertheless, gradually, they have been participating in the, in the process of norm, uh, <clears throat> in the process of norm creation by way of international legislation, norm application by way of state practice, and norm execution by way of going to the international litigation. So through this experience, East Asians have come to uh, accept the, the more balanced approach to international law in general. And this is an important point which has to keep in mind. The kind of things that, that I introduced at the beginning were written about 10 years ago, perhaps even more than 10 years ago. There may have been some element 
Uh, although I don't agree that this was due to the more intrinsic um, cultural tradition of Asia, but I think I'm sure that there was some hesitation because of the lack of experience. And so that is an important why I wanted to, to endorse what uh, Professor Kingsley has said. The second point is that even the, in the Western European countries, you have to remember that the UK, in the case of the Great Britain and the France, it was only early 1930s that they decided to accept the compulsory jurisdiction of the court in the form of an acceptance of the optional clause. And that came about early 1930s because in England, there was the first labor government came into power. In France, equally, the socialist government came into power at just about the same time. And that prompted the two governments to accept the compulsory jurisdiction. In other words, here is an enlightening element which is at work. And so, in those days at least, with regard to this traditional thinking about the acceptance of prior acceptance of um, compulsory jurisdiction as a commitment, um, Professor Kingsley asked, well, what is the reason why countries should accept, uh, in, should, should commit, it, commit themselves uh, in advance of the international uh, litigation? That's a good, 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 good question. And it, it, it really was the, the force, at least partially, it was a force of circumstances and, and, and the, the strength of the enlightenment uh, on, the, on the part of the government, which came into power, incidentally at about the same time in the early 1930s. So this is an interesting point which could, could be applicable to changing the situation in East Asia if we try to work out this enlightening process uh, in East Asia, like the establishment of the Asian Society of International Law, which uh, we have done quite recently, I think that there will be a better understanding of the situation in terms of the pros and cons uh, of, um, of going to, inter to international litigation. In China's case, of course, at the moment, when you, you see the material interest and the reciprocal interest, <coughs> There, are, there is a greater degree of acceptance of international litigation. And I talked about the field of uh, investment and, uh, and, and trade. But even in the more difficult case of human rights, I think that given the, 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 the dynamic change which is coming about in China, it takes a long time, but nevertheless, that will have an effect upon, upon the, 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 the minds of the people who are uh, in, in power who are really in charge of the problem of governance, they simply have to listen to those voices uh, in order to be able to, to, to have a good governance in, in, in the country. Because after all, the present system, uh, whether it is, um, uh, whether Xi Jinping is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a person interested in power politics or not, setting that point aside, I think that the leaders in, in this age of globalization has to have to take that, that factor into account. And that is the reason why I am less pessimistic about, about the, the future, although in a long term perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's your turn. So, oh, Jerry has the first uh, question. There's a mic coming around. This has been a very good discussion. I just want to try to add to it and maybe make a transition toward our international discussion of the afternoon. Uh, while the Chinese were rejecting the opportunity or duty to take part in the Philippine arbitration, the, a different unclose arbitration tribunal handed down an award largely against India and in favor of Bangladesh. And I thought the then new Prime Minister of India, Mr. Modi, known to be an ardent nationalist, might make a big fuss and say something adverse, perhaps not accept the award. But instead, he surprised me. He made the most gracious statement he said, in effect, it would have been better to win. But we didn't win. We lost on most of the issues about 
the uh, Bay of Bengal jurisdiction, but at least it's over now. And we can go on and cooperate with Bangladesh. I thought, what a terrific statement. What a great precedent for Xi Jinping and company, or the United States, or any major co country that goes to uh, an arbitration or adjudication and loses. A couple of months later, Prime Minister Modi came to the Council on Foreign Relations. I had a chance to ask him in public. I praised him for what he had said about Bangladesh arbitration. I said, and now you have the opportunity to go to arbitration to settle your boundary dispute that's been simmering since 1962 with China. Would you be willing to do that? Oh, he said, absolutely not. So what are the reasons that you see between such an enlightened response to a law of the sea question with a lesser power that's a neighbor and such a hostile feeling about going to arbitration with a major country on your border for which you've had to go to war before and is badly simmering. Is there, is there something Asian about this that could help us? Is this simply great power uh, aspects or is it a historical question? Uh, is it race involved? There, India and Bangladesh, of course, were part of one system. How should we understand this phenomena? I take it you didn't get an answer from, from him. He didn't give me any. He just brushed me off abruptly. So you want Judge Awada to answer? I would love to, <laughs> Judge Awada or any of my two colleagues, either of my two colleagues to give us some explanation. Thank you, Jerry. I will defer to uh, Professor Kingsley because I am, I am just back from the International Court of Justice and for me to talk about such a highly political <laughs> issue uh, is not really appropriate. But if I give a, a general answer to your question, I think that it, it really relates to the, to the issues that I talked about, that even a country like, um, like the European major powers in Europe in the 19th century, uh, or beginning of the 20th century, Great Britain, France, Germany, and all these countries were still, including international lawyers, were still talking about making the, 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 the dispute relating to the national honor and, um, and the essential interest of the state as, as an exception. So, this is something which, well, of course, if you, if you, if you take a, a, a much, more subs, uh, much more prosaic view of the matter, maybe what is involved in a dispute between uh, India and Bangladesh is more important in the material sense, but it doesn't involve the national owner. Whereas the dispute between China and India involves the question of national owner. Uh, and I think that for, for a person who, um, who is in the position of a prime minister of the country, like Pro, uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi, it would be intolerable to be able to accept the risk. Um, uh, Professor Kingsley referred to the, the question of prayer behavior that I referred to. There, of course, at, uh, when the first, first uh, judgment came about in 1962, was it? Um, the, 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 the government in Thailand was almost collapsed because of, um, of the defeat that, um, that Thailand suf had suffered in, in that judgment. So th this is something that, uh, that is related to the question of, of enlightenment that I talked about. It was the same with the 1902 arbitration that Japan was defeated in, um, in, the, in the Yokohama tax, house tax case. I mean, the emotion in Japan was so high that um, the government had a very hard time in, in overcoming that, 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 um, that um, uprising uh, in emotion in Japan. So. I think in general, disputes about uh, offshore oceans haven't raised the same tensions because there's no vested rights there. These are relatively new areas for the states to have any claim and uh, of course there's no one living there um, and uh, so it's really it's something that's it's it's a distributive issue but it's not it, 
what, what are the well, in economics people call the endowment effect. It's not that you've already got something, you're doing something with it and someone's taking it away. It's that you're trying to get as much as you can of a new thing. And, and I think th those, for sort of political psychology reasons, are more manageable. So I think that's one thing. And, and I think there's also a domestic politics element. I mean, the, 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 the people in, in West Bengal, the Bengali speakers, are quite a, have a general sympathy, and uh, there's also a practical interest in India in seeing Bangladesh reasonably flourish. It's not a, it's not a rivalrous relationship even. So, uh, uh, and then, uh, and, and I think also the decision was rather cleverly written. So, so and, and the thing was managed well. And of course, for Bangladesh, it was a strategy because they were also going with Myanmar to try to get some rights in the Gulf, and where, where their geographic position is not so promising. So. So, so, so I think there's a lot of special factors there, which, uh, but in the land issues are not like that. Uh, you saw that with Nigeria, Cameroon. Nigeria very re reluctant to withdraw, even having lost there. So, uh, so there's that. Uh, I, I think the, uh, there's also, it hasn't been mentioned, there's kind of an interesting signaling effect from one case to another. And uh, Judge Oda, Judge White's predecessor, always used to, in these maritime limitation cases, persistently had the lie that there is no law here, the court's just banging it up. Uh, uh, and he, he wrote these fiery declarations to that effect time after time. Uh, and more or less, well, they, we, they brought it to us, they just want something done, uh, and that's why the thing's here, largely. Not, not always, but um, and so he, he, didn't, he, he hesitated about it. But I think Judge Wider wrote somewhere that a lot of Japanese international lawyers, are, is, 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 very, Japan as a whole, very scrupulous about complying, but very passive about trying to... Make new law, or, and also not being so sociological, not, not having an account of law which accommodates to the sort of changing society and economics and all of that. So, whereas I think these cases are all about that. So, so that's uh, that. I, I think the, the one other thing I just, which will come up this afternoon, I'm sure. But the Pedro Branca case, a lot of people think the ICJ's decision there, which really get, it meant effective occupation by Singapore, changed the title from what it was to to the future, get, get, gave a real jolt in China and stimulated a lot of thinking, we better get out and occupy something because it makes a difference. And so, and it's a nice question, although we can't ask Dajawada it, how much the ICJ thought through the signaling of a very small case to a very big question uh, when they wrote the judgment in the Pedro Braga case. Yes, right here. Hi, Ko Yang Tang again. On the issue of why sovereign states sign up and uh, agree to jurisdiction before a dispute happens. Um, I'm, I'm sure that there are many, many theories to this. Uh, there's one that I think happens in bilateral investment treaties and multilateral investment treaties. And here, we will recall NAFTA. It was the U.S. who pushed for ISDS provision, basically saying that Foreign investors would have a right against a sovereign state if that sovereign state violated the treaty. And then for the U.S., they always thought the violator would be Mexico. U.S. investors will always be suing Mexico, but they never thought a Mexican investor would be suing the United States. Therefore, it's quite interesting now that we have NAFTA 2.0, Canada and the U.S. said, okay, let's not sue each other. We're civilized, but we will ha our investors will have rights against Mexico. They kept that in. So similarly, the U.S. has still not lost an ISDS case. Canada has. Japan has not. China barely, by statute of limitations, escaped one just recently. When U.S. loses, and that's a matter of time, I think, or Japan, or China, their views on this issue will change, I believe. I, I don't know whether this, this comment, which I totally agree with, requires any, any answer on my part. But I, I, I would certainly agree with that. And it's interesting that East Asian countries, uh, concluding many investment treaties, tend to have in recent years, have the tendency to uh, to have a greater control on the on the part of the state, mainly because that in the investment treaties, East Asian countries 
so far at least, have been on the side of the invested state rather than the investor state. And I think this, this kind of a reciprocity or lack of recipro reciprocity is, is a factor that, that, that you have to think about in, in, in assessing the, the degree of um, uh, willingness to accept international arbitration or international arbitration mechanism. I, this, just a comment on it. I, I, I totally agree with uh, what, what you have said. Thank you. I, I, my, my excellent research assistant tells me that there's only four cases brought by Japanese companies under Japan's treaties, three against Spain and one against India. And I think there's never been a case against Japan under the bilateral investment treaties. So, uh, and of course there's been issues, but other ways of solving them. And of course very often the Japanese investors are long-term with multiple interests and so, so it's not, not that they lose necessarily, but they find other ways of getting things. So. Uh, it, so I, I don't know it would be such a jolt to Japan necessarily to lose one, uh, but, well, the, the, I, I, I think the kind of striking thing at the moment is the way in which Japan intensely carries on committing itself to an investor state and telling everyone else to do so, and, and utterly refuses with the European Union to go down the path of the multilateral investment court, even though the EU and, and Canada and even Vietnam is willing to go there, but not Japan at all. So in JIPA, Japan EU agreement has no has no, has no, no settlement system because they couldn't agree on the Europeans can't do ISDS anymore and the Japanese won't. And the question is why wouldn't Japan do that? Why, I mean, they're not going to have any cases anyway. What, what, what do they care where they don't have the cases in? Uh, um, so it, and, and they will accept ICJ jurisdiction but not a, a multilateral court. So and so that's a question and maybe people here will know the answer. And some people speculate that it's because Japan is thinking about the eventual issues with China, which will get more and more, and are concerned about having an investment court which has permanent Chinese-appointed judges on it. We have time for one last question. No takers? Uh, uh, take Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, I'm Yuichiro Abe, an LLM student in NYU Law. Um, uh, as a person born in East Asia and having learned uh, Confucianism uh, partly in, in the school, I totally agree uh, Judge Awarder's uh, opinion about uh, the Confucianism uh, uh, is not, should not be used as an excuse to deny human rights or human dignity. So uh, my question is that what the uh, people outside, uh, outside of the countries uh, which uh, is not favorable for uh, human dignity uh, should do. So, I mean, uh, people outside of civil, uh, the countries uh, should do for uh, spreading the concept of human rights or human dignity. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I wanted to ask the question in the earlier session to uh, Professor Orton concerning the, 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 the difference which came about, or the changes which have come about after the Tian Tiananmen uh, uh, incident, and not with the arrival of Xi Jinping as the party secretary general, or general secretary. Because it seems to me that um, Apart from the question of China, what is really important in the, in the East Asian setting is to have a, a, a greater degree of sense of common community or, or Asian community which shares the same, same destiny. And the human rights issue at, at this moment is, is apparently is one factor which has prevented the coordination and harmonization of, um, of, um, of um, of, of, of laws in the domestic context among the members of the ASEAN. But I think that gradually there is going to be a convergence of, um, of approaches uh, through coordination first and then leading to uh, harmonization and unification in, in, in general. If you, if you succeed in creating uh, a, a greater Asian community in the, in the ASEAN area, I think that the, the kind of problems that they face respectively in the, in the Asian setting concerning the human rights and establishment of the human rights court will, will, will disappear or at least will, the difficulty will diminish uh, accordingly. 
China's case is a bit more difficult in the sense that it is linked with the special political regime that they maintain. And I think that um, at, on, the, on the one hand, I think the Chinese leadership is in a, at least in a potential dilemma, whether they have it as, as a real dilemma or not, I don't know. But at least they, they face a potential dilemma in the sense that in order to uh, make the, 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 the regime viable and survivable in, in the context of China's reality, I think they have to please the, 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 the desires of the people. And the desires of people eventually will come up with, with certain demands which they have to take into account. And that would include some aspects of the human rights um, as far as their, their, their human rights is, is uh, uh, prejudiced or jeopardized. And I think that that is, that is one factor they have to take into account. Um, uh, how they are going to solve is, is, is an interesting issue, but I think that that, that that moment will come eventually. It will take some time, but they simply cannot say that we are the communist reg or socialist regime and we have to impose our rule in spite of the violation of human rights in the, in the basic sense. I, I must make it quite clear that he, when one talks about human rights, one has to make a distinction between the human rights in the fundamental sense and various manifestations of human rights which are claimed to be uh, uh, the, 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 the aspects of human rights. For example, in the case of the, the death penalty, you remember that a few years ago, uh, European country, Western, Western European countries uh, presented a draft resolution to the United Nations in order to declare that, that, that the death penalty is against the human rights. In their view, of course, I, I accept that it is, a, it is a, a violation of human rights. And I personally think that human rights is something which is to be abolished. This is my personal view. On the other hand, to, to, to adopt a general assembly resolution in order to impose a particular form of human rights as, the, as one of the attributes of human rights through the vote of the United Nations is, is really not the kind of approach which we should, we should adopt in dealing with this question of human rights. Some countries have some social problems, whether justified or not is a, is a problem for, related to the survival of the regime, and you have to take that factor into account in, in, in thinking about how to proceed uh, in, uh, in making this uh, human rights court uh, a viable institution. Thank you. We've run out of time. I just want to remind you that we'll be back here at 2.15 for the resumption of the program. Thank our speakers, please.